Well, let me start by thanking the organizers for putting together this uh, workshop and this meeting and for giving me the opportunity to talk. I want to describe some work I've been doing over the last uh, many years together with Rajesh Kopakuma, and it won't actually directly on the face of it involve integrability, but I think integrability is happening behind the scenes. And one of the questions to you is to help us understand what's the role of integrability in our direct attempt of understanding how the CFT, ADS-CFT duality works on a sort of microscopic basis. So since this is a, a rather varied audience, I'll try to spend the first few minutes to give you the sort of a 30,000 foot view of what we are doing. At some stage, I'll probably get lost in the details of uh, 2D CFTs, but at least I want you to take away, roughly speaking, what we've been trying to do and where we are. So what we are interested in is trying to, to prove or derive the ADS-CFT correspondence. And roughly speaking, what the ADS-CFT correspondence states, which is probably known to most of you, is that there's string theory on some ADS space that's characterized by a string coupling constant and by the size of the ADS space. And since the string only sees the size in terms of string units, it's the ratio of the radius of ADS divided by the string length is due to some conformal field theory living on the boundary of ADS. And the conformal field theory I have in mind is something like SUN gauge theory. So it will be characterized by a coupling constant of the gauge theory and the rank of this uh, gauge group SUN. So this is a this is this a remarkable correspondence between two things that look rather different. And the idea of this correspondence is that the parameters are related as follows. Uh, the string coupling constant is proportional to the young nils coupling constant squared. And the radius in string units is proportional to the tooth parameter that also appeared in the previous talk. So this is the effective coupling constant that appears at large n. So what we have in mind is that we take the large n gauge theory, then the effective coupling constant is the tooth parameter. And at large n, and uh, we have to take the young mills to zero in order for the tooth parameter to be finite. So we'll be at strong, uh, at, at, at small string coupling. So we're looking at a, a weakly coupled string, um, and that corresponds to the large n limit at some uh, uh, tooth parameter. And the tooth parameter controls the size of the space, the ADS space in string units. Now, if you want to derive or prove the ADS CFT correspondence, the place you probably want to start with is where the gauge theory is weakly coupled. And therefore, what this tells you is that the radius of the space you're looking at is smaller of the same order as the string length. So LS is the typical length of a string, and the regime we are looking at is the ADS space, but the ADS space that's sort of microscopically small, I of the same size of the string in which, which is propagating in it. So this is often referred to as the so-called tensionless limit, that's the limit, I mean, you can either say the space is small, or you can say the string is large. These are equivalent statements. And the string being large means it doesn't ha it has a small tension. If the tension was big, then the string would be a tiny essential point particle. But because the tension is small, the string is very large, and it's exploring the entire space. And that's the regime of the ADS-CFT correspondence that's dual to weakly coupled gauge theory. And we want to understand ADS-CFT in this uh, correspondence, uh, in this limit. And uh, so, so we have the dual gauge theory under control. And the question is, what can we say about string theory in this tensionless limit? Now, the sort of uh, basic idea is that this is a place where ADS-CFT becomes a perturbative duality. People often say ADS string theory is a, is a strong weak duality. But the idea is that in that corner, that the tensionless string theory may become, again, the solvable perturbative string theory, but it must be a string theory. It can't be described by supergravity because, as I've just told you, it's, the string is very, very large. So the supergravity approximation is as bad as it goes, but it uh, may have a nice string theory description. It has lots of symmetries because uh, weakly coupled or free super angles has lots of symmetries, and this must be somehow represented also on the string theory side. And in some things, you can think of it as being the maximally symmetric phase of string theory. So if you think you will be able to prove ADS-CFT somewhere, maybe that's the place you should try, because that's the place that's sort of most symmetrical, that has most structure. And I think our working hypothesis is that while this is a complete, complicated theory from the point of view of supergravity, there may be a simple string theoretic description 
And the idea would be, so string theory you describe in terms of a world sheet propagating in, in the, in the space-time. And our idea is that the simplicity of the weakly coupled or free superang mills theory is replicated on the, in the, in the string theory description by the fact that it has a simple solvable or maybe even free world sheet description. So the, 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 the basic idea is that free superang mills should somehow be a free string theory, a free world sheet theory, but one that may look very different from your sigma model description of ADS, because the geometric description where you can think of ADS as a, as a geometry is probably not quite the right language in order to see the point that's so far away from this geometric region. So, so, so this is the, the advertising slogan. So, so what's, uh, what are the goods? What do we, what do we have? And we have one example where this really works to an extraordinary degree of detail. And I'll try to sketch to you what degree of detail we've understood this. And this is the case where we go to three dimensions, where we look at string theory in ADS3, cross S3, cross T4, say. <clears throat> That's the, the dual gauge theory in this context is not really a gauge theory. It's what's called the symmetric orbifold of T4. And what we have done, and I'll explain to you in more detail later on, we have found an exact world sheet description of this background that matches exactly all the data that are available on the symmetric orbifold of T4. We reproduce the entire spectrum. We reproduce the structure of the correlation functions from the world sheet. We understand exactly how this dictionary works in this example. Now, this is one example where you really understand the perturbative duality between string theory being described by an explicit world sheet theory to some dual CFT that you also have under uh, complete control. Now, the, this theory is in fact an incarnation of what I was saying earlier in the sense that the world sheet theory has effectively a free field description. There's some coset you have to do, but essentially it's a free world sheet theory based on what we call symplectic bosons and free fermions. It's basically a free theory on the world sheet. And uh, what, we've, what we've managed to, and, and this uh, realizes in some sense what's known as the hybrid formalism of Berkowitz, Waffer, and Litton. I'll explain that in more detail. And what we've shown is that, say, the spectrum of this reproduces exactly the single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbifold of T4. Now, this is the, the success story. The success story is ADS3. I think we really understand, and I hope to convince you in the rest of this talk to which extent we've understood this. Now, this is meant to be a springboard to tell us how ADS5 works. Well, I think it's a springboard. It's also the question to the audience. As you'll see, integrability will not, never appear in this analysis, but somehow integrability must be working behind the scenes, and it would be good to understand exactly how integrability works behind the scenes. As a matter of principle, as a matter of scientific hygiene, to understand how the other successful way of attacking this problem fits into this way, but also as a way of informing us how this may work for ADS5. Because the ultimate goal is to try to do this for ADS5. And last year, together with Rajesh, we made a proposal for how this could work, um, what the sort of world sheet theory should be that reproduces the free string theory version, uh, the, the free A equals to four super mills. Now, this example, we under, there are certain things that work, but there are certain things we don't quite understand. So this is more of an ongoing project rather than a complete story, whereas ADS3, I think, is essentially a complete story. So there we are, we are still struggling a little bit with exactly how to formulate this world sheet theory, and I'll make some comments towards the end of where we are uh, on our road to trying to make sense of this proposal. Okay, so this was uh, sort of the, the general overview of what we are trying to do. And in the following, I want to spend some time explaining to you where, what we have done for ADS3 and how the ADS3 works in detail. And then I'll make some comments about how we believe this should generalize to ADS5. So if there are any questions, please interrupt me, yes. So is there any higher spin symmetry in ADS? Is it just only for ADS5? No, there's also a higher spin symmetry in ADS3, and that is working, definitely working behind the scenes, and that we have partially utilized. I mean, that is uh, definitely there. So there's a higher spin symmetry underlying this, and I'll, I'll, I'll comment on this uh, in, a, in a minute. But ADS3, there's also a... Can you repeat in the microphone? Sorry, what you said. 
It's about the higher spin symmetry also for ADS3. So for ADS3, there is this, so the ADS5 story, the higher spin goes back to Klebanov and Polyakov who made this proposal for the Owen vector model being dual to one of these Vasiliev theories. And then the lower dimensional version, Rajesh and I made a proposal about 15, 12 years ago for what the CFT dual to the higher spin theory should be. And part of our motivation for understanding this was to realize that the symmetric orbifold of T4 shows exactly signs of attention of the higher spin symmetry. It contains exactly the fields that will contain to massless higher spin fields in the bulk. And that was part of the argument that led us to understand what its precise dual should be. If I want to look for signs of a gauge field appearing in the ADS5 case, I mean, where's the gauge field here? Is it in the gauging of the discrete symmetry? Yeah, so it's not it's not a perfect analog, but okay, so you, that's you don't the correct... necessarily think that there should be some gauge uh, interpretation well, I mean, you can, of this. Well, you can write. I mean, so so Rastelli and his co-workers tried to write the the correlators of T4 in some sort of Feynman-like expansion, and in the large twist limit, that looks very much like the Feynman rules of a super theory. Okay. So. There is some limit in which this begins to look like more like a conventional gauge theory, but as it comes out of the box, it's not directly a gauge theory. But, but this is the theory that is exactly dual to string theory and ADS3 equals this equals T4, as I'll try to explain in the following. Okay, so, so what's the, so in some sense to answer your question, I mean, it's been long known or long suspected that the, the, the CFT dual of string theory in ADS3 equals this equals T4 is not super mills in two dimensions. It's the symmetric orbifold of T4. Or more precisely, it's really, so, that, so there's, I think as Alessandro was also explaining in his talk, there isn't really just one theory. There's a whole moduli space of these theories. And in this moduli space, there's one specific point, which is the symmetric orbifold of T4. This theory has many exactly marginal operators. You can deform this theory. You can move around this moduli space. And that corresponds to the fact that there's a whole string, a moduli space of string backgrounds describing strings on ADS3 equals to 3 equals T4. And it's been long suspected, and that goes back to the original paper of Maldesina already, that the, uh, that the CFT dual of string theory in ADS3 equals to 3 equals T4 is this, uh, lies somewhere on this moduli space. But what's remarkable, about ADS3 is that there is actually a solvable world sheet theory for string theory in ADS3, which is unlike what we have for ADS5. And that's the case if you look at the theory with pure Neuerschwartz background and describe it in terms of this SL2R Vesumino written model. And that goes back to work of Maldesino Oguri uh, from the turn of the century. So there's some piece of over here that you have under quantitative control. And there's one special point here that you have under quantitative control. And the natural question to ask is, are these two things related to one another? And the conventional wisdom was that they are not for reasons I don't really want to get into. Um, but what we argue, and it has to do exactly with the higher spin symmetry of the symmetric orbifold of T4. So the symmetric orbifold of T4 contains many chiral fields of conformal dimension H comma zero, and also many chiral fields of conformal dimension zero comma H bar, so it contains the spin two field, it contains the stress energy tensor, but it contains infinite tower of such chiral fields. And under the ADS CFT dictionary, they correspond to massless higher spin fields in the bulk. So you know that this theory is dual to a theory that has, has massless higher spin fields in the bulk. So therefore this should be the analog of free super mills, and it should be dual to something that is tensionless in some sense. Now, if you push your luck, you say, okay, I know theory is here, so I have one set of description. So why don't I just go to the place where this becomes tensionless? I, I should go to the place where the radius of the ADS space becomes smallest among the theories I have under control. And the radius of the ADS space is basically the level of the affine Katsuri algebra. That is a measure for the size of the, of the background in string units. So the smallest level for case of this Vesomino description should be the if there ever is a tensionless limit among these theories, that should be the tensionless limit. And therefore that has the best chance to being dual to the symmetric orbifold theory. So that was the reason why we looked there. And what we did is we simply studied this theory, which in some sense had been known for 20 years and people could have looked at it when after Maldesina had written their paper, Maldesina had written their paper. 
but people hadn't quite looked at this, and there is, in fact, also a subtlety about which I'll comment, but we basically analyzed this theory that was around very carefully, and we found that its spectrum matches exactly the spectrum of the symmetric orbifold. But yeah, <clears throat> so the uh, origin of the symmetric orbifold appears considering D5 brain, D1 brain, sure. et cetera. So this is Ramon case. So mm -hmm. the naive question would be, take this Ramon background, take tension as limit, that should be related to symmetric orbifold. Why NS and S? Right, so, well, you, you may hope that uh, the symmetric orbifold will also have a description in the S dual frame, where you have the NS5 bands and fundamental strings. Well, that's the other piece. But yeah. you may be right. I mean, I would have loved to do this analysis for the background with Ramon, Ramon Flux, but I don't know how to solve it exactly. So I've been pragmatic about it. I, there's one line of theories I understand. There's one point I understand in detail. This theory has only a chance to be that if I go to the tensionless limit. So I've taken this theory and I analyzed it for k equals to one and I see what I get. And as I'll try to explain to you, I get exactly that. So it could be, be that tensionless limits are the same. Could be, I, I don't know. I mean, this is uh, part of what we would love to understand. How do you switch on Ramon Ramon flux? How does integrability help you move in this whole moduli space and so on? So what I'm trying to explain to you is if you, if you follow me, you take this theory, you analyze it, I want to convince you that it is exactly the symmetric orbifold. That's simply what you get. And you just do an ordinary string theory analysis here. So how does this work technically? Well, the truth is that this level one theory is a little bit delicate because in the maldesino Oguri description, level one is a little bit ill-defined because this is the supersymmetric SL2 and SU2 Vesomino Witten model. And if you decouple the fermions, you would end up with a bosonic theory at level minus one. So people have always discarded this theory as being somewhat sick. But there is this old description of uh, Berkowitz, Buffer, and Witten for uh, string theory in ADS3 equals S3 in terms of what they call this hybrid formalism. And there you deal with the uh, uh, super Lie algebra P as you want, comma one slash two at level K. And if you sit at a Vesumino point point there, that's meant to be exactly equivalent to the maldesino Oguri description, which is the NSR version of this theory, which you may think of as being some sort of green Schwartz-like description. And in this theory, that it makes perfect sense to take the level equals to one. The reason is that the fermions now sit in by spinner representations rather than fundamental, rather than adjoint representations like familiar in going from NSR to, uh, to Green-Schwartz. And this theory at level one is perfectly well-defined and you can simply take it and analyze it in detail. Now, what does this hinge on, this special feature of this level one theory? It hinges on the representation theory of this super Lie algebra P as you one comma one slash two at level one. So let me remind you a little bit of what the structure of this is. So what this means, it so it contains a, a bosonic subalgebra SU1, one, which is the same as SO2R at level one. It contains an SU2 at level one. And then it contains fermionic generators that sit in the bi-spinner, and there are eight of them. So there are two times two, and there are two copies. So altogether, eight fermionic generators and six bosonic generators, namely three from here and three from here. And if you think of this on the level of the affine Katzmudi algebra, you end up with the SU2 algebra at level one this level is the same as the level of the TSU1, comma one slash two algebra. Now, as many of you know, the SU2 level one theory has a very restricted representation theory because it has null vectors at level two, and therefore it has only two allowed highest weight representation, namely the, the singlet and the J equals to a half representation. These are the only representations that are compatible with SU2 level one. But if you think about, so TSU has eight fermionic generators, so if I think about a generic highest weight representation of the affine algebra on the highest weight states, I have the action of all the fermionic generators and they will form some sort of Clifford module. So the generic Clifford module that I'll get on the highest weight states will have this form. So here, the first label labels a representation of SL2R with J being the spin and I'm looking at the continuous representations, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, alpha means the additional variable that characterizes each representation. And the second label is the dimension of the SU2 representation. And you have four fermionic creation operators and four annihilation operators out of the eight. And the four, they either shift the spin up or down by a half, and they shift this spin either up or down by one, uh, by a half, and therefore the dimension up or down by one. And if you stare at this equation, 
it is, it is a generic representation of the zero mode algebra, you observe that whatever you start with here, halfway down your diamond, there's a representation that has dimension n plus two in the SU2 space. But as I've just explained to you, for k equals to one, we are only allowed two representations of SU2, namely the singlet and the spinner half representation. So even if you start with the singlet here, you would end up with the adjoint representation here, which is not compatible for SU2 level one. So what this tells you is that at level one, the only allowed representations are short representations, namely those where this term doesn't appear, where, where, the, where, the, where the representations get cut off and, and a shortening condition has to hold to make sure I don't get this representation which is incompatible with SU2 at level one. And if you analyze it, what you find is that the only representations that survive are these ultra short representations that have a doublet and a singlet in the SU2 factor. And then the shortening condition translates into the requirement that the spin of the SL2 representation has to be exactly equal to one half. There is no, so I'm sweeping many things under the carpet. Generically, these representations of SL2 are the continuous ones are, relate, are correct to describe by a half plus IS with S an arbitrary parameter. But this parameter is fixed at K equals to one to be equals to a half in order to have a short representation, which is the only representation that's allowed at level one. So the representation theory of this theory is sort of very restrictive and is the, the space is much smaller than for generic level K. And in particular, there's no continuum, and that's part of the reason why people thought previously that this could not be dual to the symmetric or default. In fact, this theory has a free field realization in terms of uh, uh, free fermions and uh, what I call symplectic bosons, or which you would call a beta gamma system. Uh, these generators, the bilinears generate u1, 1 slash 2, and you set some diagonal u1 field to zero, and then you get uh, uh, p as u1, 1 slash 2 at level one. And uh, the only allowed representation, as I've just explained to you, are really, there are only two highest grade representations. There's a nervous schwartz sector representation where all these uh, free fields are half integer moded. And then there's a Ramon sector representation where all these free fields are integer moded. And the Ramon sector representation precisely reproduces this representation as it has to be. I mean, this is the only representation it has except for the vacuum representation. And you see exactly the same structure when you analyze the free field description of this theory. So these are basically the only representations, but as we've known from Maldesino Oguri, the correct description for string theory in ADS3 will not just involve highest weight representations of this algebra, but you also have to put in these spectrally flowed images, which correspond to the solutions that wind around the boundary, and they are required in order to get an unbounded L0 spectrum, so you get a real string spectrum emerging. They're also required by self-consistency because this these representations will not close among themselves under fusion. So the additional representation you will need are the so-called spectrally flowed representations, and they are characterized by shifting up and down the mode numbers of these fermions I don't, uh, and some tactic bosons. I don't really want to get into the details of it. I'm happy to answer questions about it, but there is a very, very specific way of describing all the representations that appear on the world sheet theory and they are obtained by this automorphism from the conventional highest weight representations and you have them under complete control because you can write down very explicit formula for them. Now, what you can read off from this free field realization and what's crucial is that this theory has really only two bosonic excitations because you see it has four, fermion, four bosonic excitations but then it has this U1 constraint which effectively removes two bosonic degrees of freedom. So if you think about it, the degrees of freedom at level one that live on ADS3 cross S3, you would have thought there should be six bosonic degrees of freedom. But in fact, at level one, there are only two. And the way you should think about it is that this is like string theory on S3, the SU2 level K West Romino written model. S3, you would think has three excitations, but you know that at level one, S3 at level one is really equivalent to a single free boson. So it is really secretly only one bosonic excitation mode. So likewise here, instead of having six bosonic oscillators associated to ADS3 cross S3, you really only have two. And then the physical state condition of string theory will kill two bosonic degrees of freedom. And therefore you end up with this something that doesn't have any degrees of freedom coming from the ADS3 cross S3 factor. So the only excitations come from the T4 factor. And if you go through the systematics 
of working out what the physical state condition tells you, you reproduce exactly the single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbifold of T4, where the, 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 the states that come from the so-called W cycle twisted sector, this is the analog of the spin chain of uh, length W, come from the sector with uh, W units of spectral flow, from this funny spectrally flowed representation on the world sheet. So we have a very concrete description of how the world sheet degrees of freedom map exactly to the degrees of freedom of the symmetric orbifold. And this is not just for the BPS states, this is for the entire spectrum, the entire single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbifold. It's reproduced from all the physical states on this world sheet here. So you enumerate all the physical states on the world sheet and you reproduce exactly all the single particle states of the symmetric orbifold. In fact, there is a, a pretty concrete uh, description. So you can think of this in terms of BMN operators. You know what the BMN operators relate to from the symmetric orbifold point of view, and we can identify the corresponding modes that uh, create them on the world sheet. They look a little bit funny because they involve these fractional powers of the zero modes, but as was uh, shown many years ago, you can extend uh, a Lie algebra to include these fractional powers. And what you can then show is that the momentum conservation of BMN translates into the condition that you have an equal number of left and right moving such powers. This corresponds to shifting this alpha parameter in the continuous representations I was mentioning earlier, and it matches the orbifold invariance. It, mentions, it matches one of the invariance conditions on the world sheet, and you understand exactly how the different excitations in this BMN limit correspond to the different excitations in our world sheet theory. So there's, there's at this stage there no spin chain, right? So we have the symmetric orbifold. So there we know the states and we have this world sheet theory and we are sitting in some sense at zero string couple. And we are sitting at the free, I mean, we haven't switched on. Yes, yeah, so, so we have a world sheet theory on the. Ah, that has, well, the, I mean, that theory has a coupling constant if you wish because it's PSU 1, 1 slash 2 at level one. So that's a highly curved CFT but it has this free field description just like SU2 at level one. So oh, you are, I, I thought there is a symmetric space of a T4, no? That, right. is a, that is a- Well, there are two CFTs here. Yeah. So there's the symmetric orbifold of T4, which is the analog of free super and mills. Yes. And there's a CFT living on the world sheet of the string. I see, yeah. But in that case, originally there is some coupling constant in, but you are setting them to be zero. Right, so, so the coupling constant of the symmetric orbifold is basically one over N. That's the way you should think. So that, ah, that, one of them. Right? I mean, the, well, so from, I mean, the, so if you go back, the, so, so, so the, the string coupling constant corresponds to one over n. Mm -hmm. So the one over n corrections of the symmetric orbifold should come from the world sheet by including the higher genus contributions on the world sheet. But, so not looking on the sphere, looking at the torus and so on. And in fact, we understand this not just to leading order in one over n, we also understand all subleading one over n corrections, and I'll come to that in a, in a second. But at this stage, we are taking the n goes to infinity limit. So the n goes to infinity limit of the symmetric orbifold, that means the zero string coupling constant. We are looking at this on the sphere of the world sheet, and then we are including one over n corrections and higher genus contributions from the world sheet. So you are counting just the conformal dimension of this uh, conform field theory to, to compute the spectrum. Right, so, so, you so, so the, the dual CFT, you have this, uh, one, you have this uh, symmetric orbifold and you have to look at what you call the single particle states because the string theory, the single string states will only see the single part. So this is the analog of the single trace operators in okay. N equals to four super. So there's a sense in which you can identify what's the single trace operators in this context. And what you should come from, from the world sheet theory is that you look at this exact world sheet theory and you analyze the physical states. I mean, this is a conformal field theory, but you have to gauge fix it. So you have to look at the Virasoro primaries at L0 equal to zero, or L0 equals to one. And these should match with the physical degrees of freedom living on the boundary. So it's not that the two conformal field theories are equivalent, it's the string version, the string gauge fixed version of the world sheet theory reproduces the spectrum of the symmetric orbifold theory. Okay. So, so, so this matches the spectrum, but now you can ask what about the correlation functions? Now the correlation functions of the symmetric orbifold have quite an intricate structure. 
Uh, and there is a, 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 a nice way of calculating them that was invented by Lunin and Matur. And uh, I don't have time to go into the uh, details of it. But the idea is that you can describe the correlation functions by going to the covering surface. And going to the covering surface means lifting it by the, by the covering map. And the covering map is a map from some auxiliary surface to the coordinates. So in the, in this dual CFT, these fields are inserted at coordinates X. The Zs are the coordinates of some auxiliary Riemann surface. And you are lifting the correlation function on the sphere to some auxiliary surface via this holomorphic covering map that maps the insertion points to branch points of this map. So it undoes the W twisting around each of the points. Now, what's remarkable is that when you calculate the correlation functions on the world sheet, so on the world sheet, you have vertex operators that correspond to states. But since you are interested in calculating the correlation functions of the dual CFT, you also have to insert the world sheet operators at positions X where they, where they sit in the dual CFT. In the dual CFT, looking at a sphere correlator with vertex operators inserted at positions X, and the corresponding world sheet description are vertex operators that depend on Z, like every world sheet uh, op vertex operator does, but they also depend on X, which is the coordinate where you insert the corresponding state of the dual CFT. And you can analyze these correlation functions, and what you find quite remarkably is that these correlation functions are typically zero, and they are only non-zero if the xi's and the zi's conspire in such a way that a holomorphic covering map exists from the z's to the x's with this property. And this works not only at genus zero, that works at all genera of the world sheet theory. So this is a very unusual uh, correlation functions of a 2D CFT, but it has to do with the spectrally flowed sectors, and we have proven that this Correlation functions on the world sheet have exactly this delta function localization property. Now, why is this very natural? Well, it's natural because you see in string theory, you have to integrate the insertion points of the z's on the world sheet. And there are exactly as many delta functions as their remaining integrals after you fix the Möbius symmetry, say, on the sphere. So therefore, this integral over the world sheet will become a sum over all the possible covering maps. Because that's what exactly but this constraint will turn this integral into a sum over covering maps, and it therefore has exactly the same structure as the correlation function that you would calculate from the symmetric orbifold perspective. And this works not only at genus zero, it also works at higher genus. I, if you look at a one over n, the one over n corrections from the symmetric orbifold come from covering maps whose the one over n dependence is controlled by the genus of the covering surface which from the point of view of the symmetric orbifold calculation is some auxiliary surface. But this matches exactly the genus of the world sheet because the covering map, if the covering map, the covering map here goes from the world sheet coordinate to the space time coordinate. So if the auxiliary world sheet is a genus G, that comes from a world sheet of genus G. And thereby the one over n dependence of the correlation functions comes from the correct genus of the world sheet. So higher suppressed terms in one over n come from higher uh, world sheets of, of higher genes. So, so this tells you that not only the spectrum is reproduced, but also the correlation function, at least the structure of the correlation functions is reproduced, reproduced from this world sheet theory. And this therefore proves, I think, I mean, okay, we haven't quite shown exactly that you get the right numbers and so on, but to a physicist's way of looking at it, I think this basically proves that these two descriptions are exactly equivalent to one another. And then the idea is that if you've proven it at one point, then you can perturb both sides. And if the theory agrees exactly at one point with exactly at one point, then if you perturb it, the perturbed versions will also agree. So all the theories that are connected to the symmetric orbifold by exactly marginal operators will correspond to a world sheet theory. This is connected to our specific world sheet theory by an exactly marginal operator. And you thereby establish the ads CFT correspondence in this, uh, in this uh, specific corner. Yes, there are two questions, or well, three questions. Do you have to understand the structure of supermoduli space at higher genus to do this? Or can you learn about it by assuming well, the so, duality so is true? See, this, is, this is this tilde here. Yeah, that's part of the tilde. Yes, that's part of the tilde. So this is something that goes beyond me. Yeah. So I'm waiting for Nathan Berkowitz or somebody to work this out. But I think it's remarkable that you get this structure as the sum over covering maps, so I believe the rest will fall into place, but we haven't done that. 
What are the numbers WUI? Say again, what? What are the numbers WUI? So the Ws are the, the so, 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 so from the symmetric orbifold perspective, you're, the, the single particle states live in cycles, in the W cycle. So W is the length of the cycle. And from the point of view of the world sheet, it's the amount of spectral flow you have to apply. So the W cycle twisted sector comes from the W spectrally flowed sector on the world sheet. So the W are the different W, and you have here an endpoint function, and they have different Ws depending on in, from which cycle of the symmetric orbifold they come from. So one of the great things about ADS-CFT was that it's supposed to give us, go beyond string perturbation theory and give us a full non-perturbative description. So do you see any, I mean, do you learn anything about the non-perturbative strings? Well, so far we haven't, but it's a very good question. So, so you can ask, for example, what are the finite end corrections, right? So obviously what we are doing here is going, taking n to infinity, looking at all one over n corrections, that perturbative string theory, you can ask what are the finite end corrections? And you would expect they come from some non-perturbative effect on the world sheet, maybe some D-brains or something. And that's one of the things we are currently trying to understand. We are trying to see whether there's a nice structure for the finite N corrections to the symmetric orbifold answer. But I mean, you have it under control. You can work it out. We have written down formulas. We are just staring at them and trying to see whether we can understand their interpretation from a world sheet perspective. Okay, so, um, oh, I'm running out of time badly. So, um, so maybe I skip. Yeah, so I think the, the elephant in the room is uh, how does this fit together with integrability? I mean, we've just written down some world sheets here. We've done an honest physical state analysis. It matches, but obviously we haven't used integrability anywhere. But secretly, integrability must help us behind the scenes. We know that the higher spin symmetry helps us behind the scenes. Although also we haven't used this manifestly, but that's helped us identify the point. And it would be good to see how this very explicit examples where you have both sides under complete control, how does this fit together with what Alessandro was describing? I mean, what's this, what's the, the integrability? What's the Youngian? How does it act on these things? How does it organize the spectrum on both sides? Somehow this is a very concrete toy model where where one should be able to see this. This is not all of ADS-CFT, but this is one point where we have a precision test and we should be able to expose all our intuitions about ADS-CFT and about integrability, in particular for ADS-3, to a very concrete uh, test. And I think that's, uh, that's my homework for you. I mean, I, this part of my reason why I wanted to come here, because I think there is something interesting to be found here, but I, I don't have the expertise to do it by myself. Okay, so this is what we know about ADS-3. Now, I don't have that much time left, so let me just generalize it, tell you a little bit what we've been trying to do in generalizing this to ADS-5. <clears throat> so the question is, how much does this generalize to ADS-5? And, and Arkady will probably tell me it shouldn't because I've worked with pure nevish words to schwartz flux and ADS-5 is pure Ramon-Ramon, so obviously things will be different. It's not going to be a carbon copy. Also, the symmetric orbifold doesn't really have a spin chain description, and it's not exactly clear to which degree this will go through, but you can try to be an optimist and see whether you can guess what sort of generalization has a fighting chance to reproduce free n equals to force with n else. You just see how far you go. So we, we, we thought that, uh, I mean, this is a point I sort of skipped over, but uh, one of way of understanding this localization property is by proving the identity of a correlation function of that kind. And that tells you that this symplectic boson fields really want to be thought of as the twister fields uh, describing the space time, because that looks like the incidence relation in, in twister space. So gamma of z you should think of as being x, that's the space time coordinate. And the space time coordinate is the ratio of two uh, spinners. That look very much like a twister description of, of, of S2. So, so we thought that maybe the right way, and this is something which people had tried before, in particular Berkowitz, is that maybe the twister approach should be the right approach, and maybe we should just be naive and take our free fields and see how they could organize themselves into something that has a chance to work for ADS-5. So the obvious idea is that you basically uh, take the fields of uh, Berkowitz. In fact, they look like exactly two copies of what we had for ADS-3 because S3, namely you have now eight symplectic bosons and eight fermions, 
And then you, you observe that obviously they're bilinears, generate u 2,2 slash 4 level 1 by more or less the same reason why you got u 1,1 slash 2 level 1 before. And then you have some overall u1 field which you have to set to zero to go to p as u 2,2 slash 4. And that looks very much like the affinization of the, uh, of the oscillator construction that people in the integrability community use. So that felt like a sort of the, you are using ingredients that sort of have appeared elsewhere in this in this game, so maybe that's a natural place to start. And then the other ingredient that was crucial for ADS3 was the spectrally flowed representations. So you may expect that again you will need not just highest rate representations because otherwise the spectrum will be trivial. You won't have a stringy spectrum. You need something to lower the L0 eigenvalue. So the idea is that you also include spectrally flowed representations and you follow your guide from how you did this for ADS3 and you generalize it to ADS5. And then you get some, some uh, representation spaces. I mean, it's the Ramon sector analog and it's spectrally flowed images. And what you spot is that there is a, a basic set of modes that acts non-trivially and then there are all the other modes. So there's a certain set on these spectrally flowed representations that act non-trivially. And a natural guess would be, but this is nothing but a guess at this stage is that the physical state conditions of this would be to be constructed uh, world sheet theory should remove all of these out of the wedge modes and should retain just the, the wedge modes that appear in this W spectrally flowed sector. And you should only retain one copy of it because you should think of them as some sort of generalized zero modes. Now this is uh, obviously a leap of faith. It's not clear how you exactly get this from first principles. But if you take it and you run with it, what you see, there is a natural sense in which you should still impose the C condition on these states, and you should impose something like a Verosoro condition. And if you do that, then what you find is that the resulting spectrum reproduces exactly that of free n equals to four super mills in the planar limit. I mean, that's whatever it's worth. I mean, there is a certain, there's a set of general fields that looks very natural from the Berkowitz description. There's the spectral flow, which is the idea coming from ADS3 that tells you a certain set of modes that naturally want to appear. And if you keep those and you impose some relatively natural conditions, then you end up exactly on the spectrum of n equals to four super mills if you count the degrees of freedom. And the idea is very simple. These, uh, these free fields, these wedge modes, um, they basically, the CN, they, 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 you can think of them as being position modes uh, associated to a point of a spin chain. So this now looks like a spin chain with W many sides. And the residual gauge condition should tell you that at each side you have a singleton representation, whereas this L0 condition should give you cyclic invariance. And what this ends up with is that you get all the, the, the tensor powers of the singleton representation modulo a cyclicity constraint. And that's exactly the spectrum of three n equals to four super mills. And it comes again, I mean, from the W spectrally flowed sector. And this smells very much like a sort of a string bit picture of n equals to four. But at this moment, this is more of a caricature. This is how we would believe this should ultimately work, but we don't exactly have a first principles description of our world sheet theory. We don't have a gauge fixing condition from first principles. It's more that this is the answer and you have to work out the first principles, non-gauge fixed world sheet theory from which this should emerge as the, as the physical gauge fixed theory. Now, we have some ideas, so we, we, we used to think that we should probably have eight plus eight symplectic bosons and fermions. We're beginning to change our mind in that we believe maybe only half as many fields, maybe half of them are left moving, half of them are right moving. That would remove some of the, what you would think of as being the, ex, the excess symmetry that is set up has. And you can also think of this as, if you think about it, how this may arise, the, 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 the closed string description should come from uh, the boundaries that were originally the deep brains in the D1, D5 system, to shrinking uh, down to a point. And the vertex operator that you insert at a point, you could think of as having some sort of gluing conditions. And that could relate the original left and right moving degrees of freedom to half of them. Uh, I mean, the other half would be identified by some gluing condition. But this is all very much work in progress. So. This is uh, the way we are thinking about it. What's natural about this idea is that you would then get a PSU2 slash 2 left moving symmetry, a PSU2 slash 2 right moving symmetry, because you would only have half as many fields. So this would give you a PSU2 slash 2. That would give you a PSU2 slash 2. 
they sit inside SU2, 2, slash 4, level 1. So they would, uh, sorry, this should have been PSU2. It's actually not strictly speaking true, but uh, something along these lines is true. But you would still have a global PSU2, 2, slash 4 symmetry on the world sheet, but you wouldn't have an affine PSU2, 2, slash 4 symmetry on the world sheet. And part of the advantage of this would be you have only as many degrees of freedom as for ADS3 cos S3, and then you could hope that the same sort of physical state analysis of the berkowitz rafael paper may directly apply because you basically have, again, an N equals to 2 theory on the world sheet and blah, 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 blah. So this is uh, very much work in progress, but that's our current thinking that probably the degrees of freedom are smaller, and uh, I think that's a natural picture that's emerging, and uh, that's what we are currently working on. So let me... Uh, sum up. Um, so I think we understand ADS3 cross S3, at least in the perturbative sector, uh, very completely. I mean, we have a really a detailed description. Um, we feel it suggests the natural generalization to ADS5 cross S5. And if you follow your nose and you make some assumption, at least it leads on something that has the right spectrum. And we feel that's probably the right direction in which to identify the world sheet theory that's exactly dual to three n equals to four super mills uh, in four dimensions. But there are obviously many, many things we need to understand. We need to understand this world sheet theory for ADS5 in more detail. Obviously, we don't want to just spend our lives analyzing free fields. We want to switch on interactions. We are currently doing this for the ADS3 case where we understand this and it reproduces what we expect it to reproduce. We, the structure of correlation functions for ADS3 has this localization property. We believe there should be something similar happening for ADS5, but the details are likely to be different. Then we would like to understand sort of finite N effects. Um, there are theories with less supersymmetry you can try to analyze. And again, the big question is where, where does integrability fit into this? And can integrability help us guide us towards identifying the correct description for ADS5 cross S5? So with this, um, I think my time is up, and I thank you for your attention. So we have many questions, but there is time for a few more. Ellie and then Masaito. So when you get the SU2 plus 2 plus SU2 plus 2 uh, uh, from the integrability point of view from the spin chain, you choose uh, a vacuum. So what is the vacuum here? Like you should have this somewhere, right? Yeah, so this I mean, that's share. probably the choice of exactly whom you declare to be. So yeah, so I'm not 100% sure whether we should choose this, uh, which ones are left moving and which ones are right moving once and for all, or whether there is a, a gauge choice. So I think if you think of it in terms of arising as gluing conditions, you would think that there are different choices you can make. Um, but uh, exactly how this goes is something we, we haven't uh, yet understood. But you're right, it's a bit unnatural to sort of fix it once and for all because then you've somehow broken the overall symmetry. So there should be probably a sort of a covariant way of identifying which ones, which ones are left moving and which ones are right moving. But I ask it also because you want to find the connection with integrability, right? Right. So, yeah. Yeah, but I think at this moment in time, I would... So my strategy is that I would love to understand integrability in the ADS3 sector in detail. And then once I've understood that, then if I believe in this generalization, that should also tell me exactly how it will go for ADS5. So I feel we should first understand the ADS3 integrability and the connection to that, and then generalize it to ADS5. Masaito. I remember you had a paper about ADS3 times S3 times S3 times S1, mm. right? So, and so I would imagine that uh, you can try to do the similar truncation strategy by going to increase the null states, et cetera. So how much can you truncate and it can come closer to? Yeah, so this is a, this is a tricky point. So for ADS3 cross S3 cross S3 cross S1, it's a mouthful, that there is no berkowitz rafael in description, mm -hmm. except you would believe there should be one where you replace P as U 1, 1 slash 2 by D21 alpha. Yes, right? yes, that yes, would yes. be the natural case. Yes, so yes. there should be a D21 alpha hybrid formalism. Yes. And on a certain level, if you follow your nose, the same thing goes through. And the analog of here, we have to set the level to 1. The analog there is that you have to set the level of one of the SU2s to 1, mm -hmm. but the other one is 3. And, I, I see, I see. and then, then you, you match the spectrum. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the, the correlation functions we are struggling a little bit with. And I think this has to do with the finer point of exactly how this hybrid formalism works. That oh. we haven't, so there is a sort of free, so there's a free field realization provided both of the SU2s are at level one. Mm -hmm. At that point, you have a free field realization. Mm -hmm. And there should be some similar story, but the details haven't quite fallen perfectly into place. Oh, I see, I see, I see. But I think that will mm -hmm. work out as well. Mm -hmm. yes. Just maybe a, a comment to put it into uh, this framework of uh, um, klebanov polikov uh, original proposal. So suppose you take OAN free theory at the boundary. We can start with four dimensions, three dimensions, doesn't matter. So then you uh, don't have any anomalous dimensions. You just look at uh, bilinear operators, primary operators bilinear, and observers are correlation functions. So that should be uh, the spectrum with high spins and uh, correlation functions presumably described by some theory and ideas. Now you can take a joint theory, free scalar joint or free uh, n equal force of Young Mills. Again, no anomalous dimensions, no integrability at all. Observable the correlation function. Spectrum is massless modes, uh, high spin massless fields in ADS and massive fields, because now we have operators built out of several fields. Uh, so naively, there's no place for integrability. So it's just no anomalous dimensions, correlation functions, no reason why any integrability should play any role. But um, what my interpretation, what you're trying to do is to suggest a kind of well-sheet description for this theory in ADS which will contain massless high spins and massive with the, the right spectrum. And um, ideally we would like to understand how that Welch theory, if it exists, follows from string theory. And that, I guess that's your program. But uh, it would be very interesting to ask similar question, even though OAN models, there might be some particle theory or Welch theory describing these high spin uh, fields in Right, so I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical whether the ON theory by itself is really a consistent, I mean, it's really dual to a consistent theory because of this. Um, I mean, so, so here, here you see very much where the ON model sits, right? Because you basically have 4N free bosons and 4N free fermions. And the higher spin sector is that you simply take the, you, you, you don't think of this as SN, you think of them as sitting in a representation of UN. The, the, so you take half of the fields to sit in the fundamental and the other half to sit in the anti-fundamental of UN, and then you look at the UN singlets. Mm -hmm. And that's a sub part of the symmetric orbifold, and that's exactly the piece that's dual to some higher spin theory in ADS, and that fits together with our previous analysis of the higher spin vector model like dualities. Yeah, so I understand so, that you, that's, that's exactly so, the so, symmetry. So, so, so there yeah. you see this explicitly. So I guess what you're suggesting is we should try to see the analog of that from the world sheet perspective, which degrees of freedom are exactly captured by that, maybe in terms of the free fields on the world sheet. And then the ADS5 version of it should give you some sort of ON vector model in uh, some sort of I mean, the, the, the Klebanov Polyakov description was for ADS4, though, right? Yeah, I mean, but that's, but so you can repeat it for. You, you can probably for repeat it, yeah. Right. So that may be another strategy. So as regards integrability, I agree that at a free point, integrability is maybe using cannons to shoot at little innocent uh, flies. But obviously, as you perturb the theory away, you would expect the integrability to sort of control the perturbation. And while the perturbation may be difficult, you may, you may understand what's structures will be invariant as you perturb away and that the integrability that's sort of controlling it should be one that has the property that it's preserved under perturbations, unlike the higher spin symmetry. The higher spin symmetry is likely to be broken the moment you go away from it. The higher spin symmetry is really only a good symmetry at this point, but integrability should allow you to go away in a more controlled yeah, manner. I, certainly, I agree that if you if we assume that we know how to solve string theory, at any coupling, you can certainly interpolate to zero coupling, but in full quantum theory, and that uh, the, the whole theory is controlled by integrability. Right. So, right. So, so our strategy is to start at zero coupling. So try to identify the world sheet theory at zero coupling, and then analyze how it changes when you switch on the coupling. 
So maybe I also have uh, uh, one question. Um, so currently the integrability description for ADS3 is probably clearest in the pure Ramon case, where you can take the coupling to zero in principle. And the question is, is there some way to use either the Vesuminovitten description or even, even better maybe this Bertwitz Bafavitten description to somehow study the the case in which you have a little bit of Ramon Ramon flux, but, that, but then you also analytically continue or continue in some way K to zero? Right, I mean, this is, uh, as we discussed, yeah. I mean, obviously you would try to see what, what does it mean to switch on the Ramon Ramon flux. At K equals to one, as we discussed, this may be a little bit different than for generic values of K, but you can repeat this to a certain extent also for generic values of K, and you should be able to see what are the structures that, uh, but is there a sense in which you could try to do k equals zero in this language, or is just that? Breaks? That I've never that I've never understood how that would. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's the nothing theory. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the action is zero, and then mm -hmm. so then I don't really know what to do. In your discussion of the free n equals four spectrum, you phrased it in terms of uh, gauge invariant uh, operators, but we can also scatter gluons at weak coupling and think of the states as being, you know, plane waves in the adjoint of the gauge group. Do you think there's a way to match to that description? Uh, that are, that are, uh, that we have, I mean, we are, at the moment we are looking at the gauge invariant spectrum. We haven't yeah. thought about, I mean, so the gauge group doesn't appear anywhere. Right. right. I mean, it's uh, just like here. I mean, the n, you, you only see the n goes to infinity limits. So in some sense, you see the, the, the stuff that uh, is left behind after the gauging has done its job. How you would see things like uh, the gluons, I, I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, one last question, Ben. Um, so in the ADS3 story, this uh, level uh, setting k equals one, uh, there was a, you may, uh, there was a, a sense that I mean, this corresponds to setting level one in the in the West Amino Witten model, and then uh, there was a level one level in the algebra. In the ADS five S five story, you set the level equal to one in the algebra. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, does that have any? Do you have any physical interpretation, or if you if you, I mean, because it's an integer, I, I just. Well, I mean, we, we we thought. I mean, this is sort of looks like a twister description of ADS three, and we were trying to imitate what could be a twister description of ADS five. So. If you look at, I mean, I think if you look at this Berkowitz uh, description of uh, what he tried for the, I mean, he basically had exactly these fields when he tried to write down the twister string on ADS5 plus S5. But there is discrete parameter or not? Discrete parameter? Well, there is, there is, let's so, I mean, he had these three fields. And if, so these three fields are not any Lie algebra to start with. But these are the three fields that will give you. P is U2, 2, 2 slash 4 at level 1, if you look at its bilinears. And they look exactly like the same sort of free fields that we had for ADS3. So for ADS3 equals S3, we want to sit at level 1. There we have a certain set of, a certain free field realization. And the observation was that the proposal for the twister string looked like a doubled version of that free field realization that came from P is U1, 1, 1 slash 2 at level 1. So indirectly, it will therefore give you PSU 2, 2 slash 4 at level 1. But why you should get level 1, I don't know. I mean, it's not that we have a, I mean, in some sense, this looks like you have sort of as small an NS flux to support you. And maybe this is zero Ramon Ramon flux in some regularized sense, but I, I don't really know. Okay. So let's thank again Matthias for the talk and for answering all these questions. <laughs>